Throughout indentureship, the number of men who crossed the Kalapani outstripped the women three to one. A strong caste system, traditions of child marriages, and the protective extended family norms kept the women of India in their villages, encouraged by the beliefs that indentureship was a temporary arrangement. But as contracts were extended and hopes of returning to India diminished, women were encouraged to make the trip. For those who braved the dark waters, the numerical deficiencies endow them with a unique bargaining position for the life that was best for themselves. Though somewhat free agents working for their own wages, some unavoidably became victims of the system. Punima recalls the treatment of women on the estate and the anger of her father when an overseer whipped her young and tired mother. And when them go to work, them working, breathing, the driver come and hit my mother. When them hit my mother, my father say, we now have no right to hit my wife. Because India rule is that. He say, them tell my father, the woman, and them tell my father. He say, look how he hit Bhauji. He say, nah, we want to go India again. He, from Pitimon, then start to come San Fernando. From San Fernando, then watching the sea, very high road to pass, very high road. In the sea, you go get the road. Years later, some women found ways of paving roads through the sea from Trinidad to India, not as SKPs, but as young students who would become torchbearers fulfilling a desire not necessarily their own. Like Rajande Ramkisun, a young Debe girl who became the first female recipient of a Jerningham Silver Medal while at Naparima Girls High School in San Fernando. Her father's dream took her to Prince of Wales Medical College in Patna, Bihar, where she successfully pursued a career. She received nine first-class honors and with them nine gold medals during her scholarship, an unbroken record held previously by her Indian professor who received eight first-class honors. I did not choose to study medicine. My father told me to study medicine, and being a, an obedient daughter, I did it. Gynecology is a speciality, and with her distinguished work in the field, Rajande Ramkisun is today the first woman in the world with the title of fellow from the London-based Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She has worked in Europe, North America, and Asia. It was in Hong Kong, Rajande Ramki soon identified an association between ectopic pregnancies and the use of the intrauterine contraceptive device, considered a breakthrough for obstetricians. She is an established poet whose work has been published in more than 15 anthologies, journals and magazines from London to the West Indies. Their ink wrote the lustres of her life, marked hope with her hand on the limbs moving in her womb. Despite her achievements, however, the world has not been an easy playground for Rajande Ramkisun. The fifth in a family of nine children, she virtually struggled to reduce her father's disappointment, who would have preferred sons instead of six daughters, who were allowed to attend the primary school only because of its close proximity to the family house. Secondary education away from Debe was not a welcome proposition by Father Ramkisun. Late arrivals from San Fernando led to the abortion of two of his daughters' quest for higher learning. Young Rajan Day, fearful of a similar fate, masterminded a plan. We would arrive home sometime, sometimes at 8 p.m. the night. Now my father would be very worried and frustrated and I could not understand why he used to be so because nothing was wrong with me. 
I mean, I, I just arrived late. That was all that all that had happened. But he used to be worried and would threaten that he'd never send me back to school the next term. And I used to get very worried. And I knew that he would make good that threat because he had already um, stopped my two elder sisters from going to high school for the same reason. So I devised a secret plan in my head. And I said that if I placed first in class at each term, he could never send, he could never stop me from going to school. And if he did, I would take the report to my headmaster, the DBCM school, for whom my parents had the greatest respect, and he was bound to send me back to school. It so happened I always placed first, and they were very happy. And they never stopped me from going to school. Many Indo-Trinidadian female pioneers would endorse such an experience. Like Sheila Mary Tilaksing, the first female Indo-Trinidadian graduate in law, who, unlike Rajan Day, grew up in an urban middle-class business family. Taken to school by a chauffeur was not a benefit to young Sheila, as much as it represented the instructions of a father who insisted on that yoke of protection. It was Sheila's mother whose influence took her to read law in London, at a time when Indo-Trinidadian family fortunes were reserved to educate the boys. Her age over her young brothers was her ticket to Europe. And the decision to secure business interest in the family's pioneering cinema industry was her mother's successful argument. Of necessity, Sheila Tiluxing had to painstakingly conceal many girlhood dreams, including the hope one day of becoming a famous artist. We had a family of girls and just two boys who were young. And um, she felt that she needed someone to um, go into, uh, to be more educated, for, to, to manage the business and all that. So she insisted that I uh, go to study law. My father was kind of reluctant, um, but he went along with it. Out in London on that one date with destiny in 1947, she returned home a lawyer who was called to the bar in 1952, concentrating on conveyancing and property law, dealing mainly with land litigation matters willed to the sons of Indo-Trinidadian families. Sometimes it's very difficult to make them see reason that uh, not everything they wanted could be legally done. Uh, the way they, sometimes you have difficulties in translating their ideas and their desires into what can legally be done. Sheila Tiluxing also served as a lecturer and examiner at the Hugh Wooding Law School and is considered an inspiration to many young female aspirants in the legal profession. It is with a sense of pride that I see so many female members of, uh, of our community um, uh, graduating in, in law. More than a trailblazing attorney at law, Sheila Tiluxing remains unconventional in another sense. Still unmarried and with no regrets, she's living proof against the stereotype of the domiciled and docile East Indian wife. If anything, this generation of their Indo-Trinidadian counterparts would prove that as much as they valued family life, a destiny in marriage with children was not the only option available to them. And the intention was never that, to, uh, to sacrifice one for the other. Both Rajan De Ramkisun and Sheila Tiluxing recognized the importance of education in lifting their status in life and in many ways have given back to that noble profession. However, one Indo-Trinidadian woman who has made significant strides in teaching is Anna Mahes, who at the age of 28 became the youngest female principal of a secondary school in Trinidad and Tobago. She was on scholarship at a Canadian university hoping to pursue the sciences. But on return to fulfill part of a contract, young Anna's date with destiny began in Curep. She was taught at one bastion of female education in Trinidad and Tobago 
and gave to another. St. Augustine girls became her mission as she molded the lives of thousands of young ladies who passed through the classrooms of this well-respected institution, producing women of stature of whom Trinidad and Tobago remains proud. Her daughters, she considered them, a title bestowed on Anna by their parents. They used to call me Betty. Betty, this is our child, but this is your child. You take care of her. And over the years, I have seen those young ladies develop, achieve, move on to the university, which was also free. Tertiary education was free. Born in Guayco Sangre Grande, both her parents taught at the Presbyterian school there. And as fate would have it, Anna Mahes would walk the corridors of achievement to become associated with every facet of education in Trinidad and Tobago, a profession she describes as a magnificent obsession. I sacrificed a life of marriage and a family for a career as a principal. And I feel what I may have achieved by producing 5,000 young ladies who would hopefully, and I'm sure have been, serving this country. I have no regrets because I have so many children and I feel that I, my life was cut out to be a career person. Apart from several certificates of appreciation, Anna Mahes is the recipient of two national awards for outstanding and meritorious services to education and two honorary doctorates from university campuses at St. Augustine and Canada. Officially retired, Dr. Anna Mahes admits that it has been a life of many challenges and sacrifices, but one that has been rewarding and fulfilling. When I sit on the, on the um, stage of the university graduation now as the chairman of the university council. I look with pride at my girls crossing the stage as doctors, dentists, veterinary surgeons, pharmacists, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, you name it. The success of any family is attributed to the unfailing contributions of the wife and mother to the care and the bringing of her offsprings. Sacrifices and hard work, self-denials and sleepless nights are common factors associated with such an achievement. Gauri Rampasad is one such success story. Born of indentured parents, she grew up in Port of Spain, had little elementary education, like most young women of those days, customs and traditions prevented Gauri from socializing, especially with male counterparts. You couldn't talk to a boy, you couldn't, you couldn't watch even another person, you know, besides your mother and father, and everybody was khaki, khaki and whatnot, you know, from India, living in Port of Spain. There was no public place for worship. Family prayers usually took place in the house. The language, however, recited then was different to the Hindi as spoken today. What does it mean? Well, I'm very happy to sit with you and speak to you. To Mango to Pucho, whatever you would like to ask, ask me. She got married at the age of 12 to Dosaran Rampasad. Innocence led to the belief that it was another Dolly House session with her friends, since it was an arranged union. The couple had their first child two years later, and for young Gauri, looking after the baby was the responsibility of her elders. However, the seriousness of motherhood stepped in with her second offspring five years later. I had Radha, 20 I had Kamal, 21 I had Nirmal. And after that, I stopped for six years, then I had Indra. I stopped for about seven years, then I had Anand at 40 something. Gauri Rampasad's initiation into the business world came through Deo, 
who owned a taxi fleet and would often undertake repair jobs himself. His young wife supported his mechanical attributes, learning in the process the tricks of the trade, from spanners to spares. And then those days was only like Morris cars and small cars, one or two, and then they had Chevrolet, Ford, Chrysler, just few cars. They didn't have much cars like now. So they find a person who will know all the, all the parts. From George Street to Barataria to the Quaise in Sawa, business expansion took place, and Gauri Rampasad's talents and fortunes grew. So it was work all day. <laughs> no rest. Needless to say, her appetite for work developed through her spouse's determination to succeed. If you could see her husband working, you have to work too, and work with pleasure. Her husband's demise came 38 years after marriage. Though traumatized by his passing, her inner strength was powered by her newfound role as matriarch of the Rampasad clan, a position she is successfully honored to the letter earning respect as the one woman over whom men in grease and metal have no superiority. And her advice to young female entrepreneurs, hard work, determination, and strength. Well, those in business, I'll tell them that, um, that you, you, you've got to be brave, you've got to be a pusher, you know? And those with children, they must learn to curb their children and try to, you know, talk to them and show them the good and the bad. The hallmark of Gauri Rampasad's life in business and her inspiration to live on. Not so much my wealth, but my children. I have good children. And they did everything good and they are successful in life. And this is my happiness. Reminiscences are often emotionally painful as aging Indo-Trinidadian wives and mothers tell their stories. Like 75-year-old Pulo Singh, a mother of 10, whose arranged marriage brought her to Kelly Village from Curep. Her husband Amar, an agriculture worker, brought home pay packets which could hardly satisfy the family's needs. And, as in similar cases, making ends meet was a difficult proposition. So sometimes I get $50, sometimes I get $20, $100 when the fortnight come. But I have a cow and I have a garden without us surviving with them. She cultivated a small sugarcane plantation to supplement the meager income, virtually being forced to become the proverbial jack of all trades, with tremendous support from her eldest child. We hold a better cane. And we go it to, he go it to row and I go it to row. The father with, with a half, with a little piece, a, a bed, but half. Well, we going up and come and meeting him. He was a little slower than us, right? But we cut, we cut, we came. Tending to her children's needs was sometimes awesome, but certainly a great challenge to motherhood and indeed a joy to sustain their growth. I had to sew the clothes, get the clothes, sew the clothes, I was able to buy. So, so the clothes, the boys won't could buy, but the girls want to also buy clo clothes and um, cloth and so for them and send them to school. And, well, when, see the, 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 when the evening come, I had to cook for them, put them in the ground, put the plate, they sit down and eat. They eat in. They make call, when they make a noise, I beat in them. As I tired myself. But the planning never stopped there. During the night, she would contemplate the next day's chores, as tomorrow often began with a similar routine. Pregnancy was not a deterrent to Pulo's quest for her family's survival. And even with morning illnesses, the canes had to be reaped. So I'm now going to land, I train up, I ain't feeling good. I sit down in the cane root, I get up again, I cut to do what I had to do. But most of it, not all the time, you know. Sometimes I stay home, sometimes I go. When I will, I go and I do it. Pulo Singh was a disciplinarian in the home, an inherited trait from her Kirep upbringing. And with seven girls in the family, home economics was a natural educational tool 
as she mapped out tasks and targets. Tell them to do, if they had to wash, if they had to mop, they help me do that, they're doing that, right? When I do it, they, they, one another, they call in, I also beat them, right? I say, well, all you have to do it. One of them going to mop, one of them going to wash. Sunday was perhaps the only rest day, and Mama, as she is affectionately called, devised a unique way to achieve it, especially with children around the house. And before they take lunch, I had a little, um, a little bit of rum, and I gave them a little, little bit until they eat, and eat and go and sleep. And when they go to sleep, I get a little rest myself. Then I get up again, start to iron for them from Monday morning. So Monday morning, I had to get them ready to go to school. Four girls had to go to, to, to Mahasapa school. Two when, I'm, um, two when I'm going to high school, or Rima. When matters seemed financially stressful, she would seek her parents' assistance, but never for one moment felt that she had failed her children. Divine inspiration would see her through. But even then, Pulo Singh remained an independent wife and mother. I take no credit from nobody. I take nothing from nobody. I say, well, one day this children would get big. And with her prayers, they have. Holding their own in various ways, the youngest of whom heads the family business, pioneered 10 years ago by her eldest child, whom she calls her eyeball.